Okay, uh, why don't we get started. Um, today we're going to come full circle back to the first lecture. So we, in the first lecture, we talked by, we started by drawing a supply and demand graph. We've now spent the last few weeks explaining where supply and demand curves come from. And now we're going to talk about the supply and demand curves. You know, uh, what do they know? Do they know things? Let's find out. So no one? No one on that? OK, thank you. All right, so uh, let's start by talking about uh, shocking the supply and demand curves. Shocking the supply and demand curves. That was a BoJack Horseman reference for those of you who missed that. OK, let's, uh, let's talk about shocking the supply and demand curves. So let's start with a review of the supply and demand framework uh, that we introduced in the first lecture. So let's go back to figure 9-1. We've got the market for gasoline. OK, on the x-axis is big Q, quantity of gas. This is a market level diagram. On the y-axis is the price of gas. And as we said, the first lecture is a supply curve that's upward sloping, representing the fact that higher prices call forth more supply. We now know where that comes from. We know that what happens is when there's a higher price, firms can now afford to move up the marginal cost curve, which is a supply curve. So we know where that comes from. We have a demand curve, which is downward sloping. Higher prices lead to less demand. We know where that comes from. We know that as the price of a good rises through both income and substitution effects for normal goods, consumers will want less of it. So we know where that comes from. So we now have derived these, and we're back where we started in equilibrium. So let's actually start by asking, what happens? Uh, let's by start by asking, as we move forward, how do we want to think about these curves? And the way we want to think about them is we want to think about the demand curve. We want to think about these as willingness to play, pay and willingness to supply curves. So think about the demand curve as a willingness to pay curve. How much are you willing to pay to get the next unit of the good? Or is how much is the market willing to pay to get the next unit of the good? OK? And the supply curve is willingness to supply. OK? Uh, and equilibrium is the point where consumers' willingness to pay for the next unit of the good meets the supplier's willingness to supply the next unit of the good. When those are equal, we're in equilibrium. So that's kind of where we start. Now let's, asking, now let's ask, what happens as these curves shift? So for example, let's take this market and imagine the tastes change. Suddenly, everyone wants to drive big cars. Everyone wants to drive SUVs. Okay? What does this do to the market for gas? Well, so what does this do? Well, what it does, yeah, go ahead. SUVs require a lot more gasoline so the demand goes up? Yes. SUVs are what we call a complement, a complement as opposed to a substitute, are a complement for gasoline. When demand for SUVs goes up, demand for gas goes up. So the demand curve would shift out. So we would end up in a situation like figure 9-2. But let's talk through the dynamics. All you would see in the market is quantity of gas sold would go up from Q1 to Q2. And price of gas would go up from P1 to P2. But let's talk about underneath how we get there. What happens is demand shifts up. People want more gas because they want to drive these gas-guzzling cars. So sh demand shifts from D1 to D2. What does that mean? That means that at, at the previous equilibrium price, if the price didn't change, if the price stayed at P1, what would happen? Well, we'd no longer be in equilibrium because People, firms would still be happy to supply Q1 units of gas, but people would want way more than that. We would have excess demand. If the price didn't change, there would be excess demand. People would want more than the Q1 units of gas. Suppliers will recognize this and say, well, if people want more, we're happy to produce more, but remember, we have to respect the marginal cost curve and marginal cost of rising. If we're going to produce more, we're going to have to charge more. We're going to have to move up the supply curve. So a shift in the demand curve makes firms move along the supply curve. We want to keep shifts and movement along curves separate. A shift in the demand curve, meaning people are saying to gas producers, we want more gas. Gas producers are like, great, we want to give you more gas, but we're going to have to charge you more to do it because our marginal cost curve is upward sloping, which is our supply curve, as we learned. So the price rises. 
and we need to reach a new equilibrium at E2. So we don't see these steps in practice. In the end, we just see the price change. But think about it as two steps. Demand shifts out, creating excess demand. Providers, to meet that excess demand, have to produce more. And to produce more, they're going to charge a higher price. And that moves you from E1 to E2. Okay, So we have a shift in demand, which caused to slide up the supply curve. Okay, Now let's think about a different example. Imagine war breaks out in the Middle East. Not too hard to imagine, unfortunately. Um, and as a result, the quantity, um, so uh, suppliers need to pay more to get the oil that they use to make gasoline. Okay, What does that do? We see that in figure 9.3. Now what happens is for every, for every unit of gas, suppliers need to charge more. Their underlying marginal costs have gone up because they have to pay more to get the oil. That's a variable cost of production of gas. So their marginal costs have gone up. Their marginal costs going up mean their supply curve has shifted upwards. Okay? For every unit of production, their marginal cost is higher because their variable costs have gone up. Therefore, they're going to need to charge a higher price to break even. Okay? We're still in perfectly competitive markets where nobody's making any profit. Okay? They're going to charge more to break even. So now let's once again talk about the dynamics of what's happening. The dynamics are the cost of, and the input to the suppliers went up, oil. Okay? Their marginal cost serve shifts up to S2. So they want to charge a higher price. So if we kept the price the same as it was before, suppliers would say, we don't want to sell Q1 anymore. We're not interested in selling Q1 anymore at that old price. Okay? That doesn't interest us. Consu Therefore, consumers want more than providers are willing to sell. And we once again have excess demand. So we, in both cases, we get excess demand. In the first case, we got excess demand because consumers wanted more. The lower the consumers taste shifted, so they wanted more gas at every price. Now we have excess demand, not because taste shift, but because costs go up. So providers don't want to provide as much gas at every price. So what happens is providers are going to say, fine, we're going to charge a higher price, okay? and we'll slide up the demand curve. Because as providers charge a higher price, people want less gas. At a higher price, you want less gas through the substitution effect, because you'll buy other things instead, and through the income effect, because you're effectively poorer, because the price of gas went up. For those reasons, you're going to shift up the demand curve and reach a new equilibrium at E2. So that's the underlying dynamics of how shifts in supply and demand lead to changes in quantity and price. OK? So that's basically uh, what we're seeing. Questions about that? Yeah? Um, when they uh, are like gas and like, how does the substitution effect like, work? Great, great question. So what's the answer? How do you, what's the substitution effect with gas? Well, you've answered yourself. It's not driving. It's taking the bus. It's driving less. It's uh, walking or taking your bike. So once again, whenever we think about substitution effects, you want to think about the, the opportunity, the next opportunities you could use instead. OK, good question. Other questions? OK, so here's an interesting point. Look at figure 9.2 and 9.3. In both cases, the price went up. Okay? In both cases, the price went up. So we can't tell. If a price goes up, you can't tell from that alone whether there was a shift in demand or supply. So if I, for example, asked you on an exam, or your mom came home and your mom asked you, hey, um, if the price goes up, does that mean demand shift or supply shifted? You say to your mom, I don't know. I can't tell with just that information. I can do what happened to quantity, too. OK, and then you say to your mom, good question. OK, so let's go through the reasons why the supply and demand curve shift. So why do curves shift? OK, well, on the demand side, there's at least six reasons why demand curves would shift. So why do, why do demand curves shift? OK, one reason is taste change. I just used that reason, taste change. OK, people want different things. OK? A second reason is that income changes. Second reason is because people are richer or poorer. And so that makes them want different quantities, even with the same tastes. 
A third reason is the change, the change in the price of a complementary or substitutable good. OK? Now, that's different. I should separate. So actually, the example I gave before was this. Taste change is slightly different. So change in price of a complementary substitutable good is what I talked about. Taste change would be literally for everything held in equal, I just wake up on morning psyched to drive. That'd be a taste change. Okay? So really, this, the example I used was a change in the price of a complementary. No, no, price didn't change. No, I go back. I go back. The example I used was a taste change. People wanted more SUVs. But at the same time, imagine different, a different change. Imagine that we're looking at the demand for babysitters and the price of movies goes up. Okay? Well, movies are complementary with babysitters. You guys don't worry about this. You don't have kids yet, but trust me. <laughs> movies are complementary with babysitters. That basically, the more you go to the movies, the more you need babysitters. So if the price of movies goes up, that's going to lower my demand for babysitters. Or vice versa, imagine that how the, a change in the price of movies affects the demand uh, for uh, Netflix. Well, those are substitutable. As the price of movies goes up, I'm going to want more Netflix and less babysitters. So changes in price of complementary substitutable goods uh, will also affect uh, my demand curve. Um, another thing that could affect the demand curve is a change in the market size. So we will talk in a couple lectures about international trade. If suddenly you're selling goods to a much larger market, that will affect the demand for your good. So preference haven't changed, price haven't changed. You just got, suddenly got a bunch of new customers. That will affect demand for your good. Okay? And the last thing that can change, the most subtle way demand can change, is expectations of the future. So for example, imagine you expect the price of gas to go up tomorrow. You might buy more gas today. And that would be weird. For example, you say, look, nothing changed today. Your taste didn't change, prices, nothing changed, but people buy more gas, what's going on? It's that they expect the price to change in the future. So expectations of the future can actually drive demand today. Okay, we've all experienced this in various aspects of our lives. Okay, so those are the reasons why the demand curve can shift. So a lot of reasons why the demand curve can shift. For the supply curve, why the supply curve shifts is sort of much simpler. There's really only two reasons. Okay, one reason is changes in input costs. And the second reason, changes in input costs. And the second is a shift in the technology in production. So either production function changes or input costs change. That's pretty much why supply curve shift. OK? So that sort of gives you a catalog of how to think about these curve shifting. I have a fun example in the videos that go with this class, um, which is that uh, uh, we all know Kim Kardashian is. Uh, you, may, you may or may not know she has more Instagram followers than there are people in France. She's got 80 million, about 80, it's up to about 100 plus million Instagram followers. Kim Kardashian a few years ago uh, tweeted out a picture of herself in an exercise corset, she called it. She basically claimed a corset is this thing they used to wear like back like when we didn't care about women much at all, and we just made them wear these incredibly constrictive things uh, to make them look skinnier. Okay, they're basically like a, like a brace you'd wear to make you look skinnier back in the old days. And Kim Kardashian said, actually, if you wear a corset when you exercise, it helps you lose weight. Well, actually, she's totally fucking wrong. Okay, <laughs> it doesn't. Okay, there's no, it does not help you lose weight. But she tweeted this out, and there was a massive increase in demand for exercise corsets. Okay, and the one company that made them made scads of money. There was a huge demand shift based on this Kim Kardashian tweet. Okay, so tell me what happened next. Yeah, more companies entered. Okay, so what happened was profits were being made on exercise corsets. So more companies started making exercise corsets, and they came in and drove those profits down. Okay. So that's a classic example of how demand shift and how the market in the long run will respond to return us to zero profits. Zero profits in the long run, in the short run, some corset money companies made a lot of money. They should they owe Kim. Okay? But in the long run, profits go to zero. Yeah. Uh, 
with uh, expectations for the domain curve shifts, is that like when companies be like, oh, like there's like these coupons, like limited time sales? Would that be an example of domain? Yeah, and, and, and anything where you basically, well, no, but once that's on, that's a price change. A limited time sale for a good is literally just a standard the price changed. Okay, uh, it's sort of you think the sales could happen in the future, so you buy less today. That's sort of the expectations. Okay, so that shifts in demand supply curves. Let's now talk about what determines the shapes of supply and demand curve. So what determines the shapes of supply and demand curves? Okay, so basically. The effect, not what determines the shapes, so we're talking about what determines the shapes. So we're talking about the role the shapes of supply and demand curves play. Let me rephrase that. We already know what determines the shapes. We covered that the last 10 lectures or whatever. Now we're talking about the role that shapes play as demand curves shift. So for example, let's think about a standard figure 9.3 shows what happens with a supply, the figure we're just looking at, okay? Figure we're just looking at, figure 9.3, shows what happens when the supply shift with a standard downward sloping demand curve. Okay, which is that the price goes up, quantity falls. However, imagine instead we had perfectly inelastic demand. So for example, for insulin. Then what would happen? Well, figure 9.4 shows if demand's perfectly inelastic, quantity won't change. So if there's a supply, sh if there's a shock that shifts up the supply curve like war in the Middle East. So this is the question here, why wouldn't gas just be perfectly inelastically demanded? In fact, in the short run, gas is actually pretty inelastically demanded. Okay, it's not perfectly inelastic, but it's pretty inelastic. Okay, so in that case, you would see just prices going up and quantities wouldn't change. Now, in the long run, do we think the elasticity for gas will be higher or lower than the short run? The, the demand elasticity for gas. Hi, somebody, somebody raise their hand, tell me why. So raise your hand, tell me why. Somebody else besides people always answer questions. Yeah. Uh, people can shift towards electric cars. Exactly. In the short run, all you can do is drive less. And we got to drive to work and stuff like that. In the long run, I can buy a different car. So it's an example of long run versus short run, how it can affect these elasticities. OK? Now let's think instead about a perfectly, in, perfectly elastic demand. The demand for, I don't know, you know, tchotchkes in a market or something like that. OK? Perfectly elastic demand in figure nine. It's always hard to think of markets with perfectly elastic demand. It's easy to think about firms having perfectly elastic demand. It's hard to think about markets. But think about a market for a certain kind of candy. OK, well, there's another kind of candy that's just as good. OK, so those are markets which are fairly elastically demanded. OK, uh, there you see when the supply shifts, price doesn't change, only quantity does. And why is that? That's because demand's perfectly elastic. You can't change the price. If you try to raise price by one penny, you'll lose the entire market. If you lower the price by one penny, you gain the entire market, and then you'll, your profits will go away because your marginal cost will be through the roof. Okay, so with perfectly elastic demand, okay, you're going to get prices fixed, but only quantity changes. Okay, so basically, uh, that's sort of how we think about these extremes. The bottom line is that's how the shapes of supply and demand will affect the response to shocks. Okay, the more elastically, the more elastic is demand, the more price shock will come through in quantity and less in prices. The more inelastic is demand the more supply shock will come through in prices and not in quantity. OK? Any questions about that? OK, so now let's go on to what we can do with the supply and demand curves. So now we're, we're the masters of supply and demand curves. We know where they come from. We know why they shape the way they do. We know what happens when they shift. And we know what happens, how that shift depends on their shapes. So we, we own supply and demand curves. Now let's go, what can we do with them? And what we can do with them is use them to take the next step in this class from positive to normative economics. So far, this class has been completely focused on positive economics. Why do firms behave the way they do? Why do consumers behave the way they do? And we haven't talked at all about whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Well, we need a new set of tools if we're going to move from positive economics about why things the way things are to normative economics about the way they should be. Okay. And those set of tools we're going to derive from supply and demand curves. And this is critically important. Because for example, let's take where we ended the last lecture, or the lecture, last lecture, I think, talking about how with perfectly, or in the middle of the last lecture, talking about how in a perfectly competitive market, under a set of assumptions, all firms are zero profit in the long run. 
Okay, so we, you buy that, that's, but you have to ask yourself, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Is zero profits long run good or bad? Well, on the one hand, firms are cost minimizing, that's good. On the other hand, why would anyone start a business in the long run they're gonna make no money? That's bad. So how do we think about trading those things off? How do we think about whether it's a good, idea, good or bad to have long run zero profits? Okay, this is the question, these, this set of questions is what we turn to with, with the notion of welfare economics. Welfare, now welfare was going to be used in two senses in this class. Mostly when I say welfare, I'll mean as a measure of well-being. Mostly when I say welfare, I mean welfare is well-being. Sometimes we say welfare, we mean cash payments to poor people. That's like welfare payments. That's not what I mean usually when I say welfare. I'll try to distinguish what I mean the other thing. When I say welfare, I don't mean the way it's used in the political debate, meaning cash payments to poor people. I mean welfare is a measure of well-being. And welfare economics is the tools of normative analysis. The tools of welfare economics are the tools of measuring uh, uh, um, well-being. And we're going to start by talking about the concept of consumer surplus. It's going to be the first thing we're going to use when we talk about welfare economics is consumer surplus. OK? Now, if we want to measure well-being, however, we have a problem, which is how do you measure how happy I am? My utils. But utils don't exist. So we've got a fundamental challenge here, which is our indicator of well-being is utility function, which isn't a real thing. Okay? We use it to derive decisions, but we don't actually have a measure of well-being that gives real meaningful inputs. So what do we do? We do a clever thing economists thought of a long time ago, which is to use the concept of compensating variation. The concept of compensating variation. What does that concept mean? That means that instead of asking you how happy you are, I ask you how much would I have to pay you to become, less sad, to become sadder? Or how much would you be willing to pay to be happier? So I can't measure your marginal utility in dollars. But I can measure how many dollars you would pay to buy the next good. Or how many dollars you pay me not to be punched or whatever. Okay? I can basically measure those things by essentially ask, asking you, how much would you pay to be better off? Or how much would you be willing to pay not to be worse off? And those are what we call the idea of compensating variation. We measure your well-being by the money equivalent that you give to us okay, in expressing your preferences. And what we can then define consumer surplus. We'll define consumer surplus, which is our first measure of normative welfare economics, as the benefit that a consumer gets from consuming a good above and beyond the price of that good. The benefit that a consumer gets from consuming a good above and beyond what they paid for that good. That's consumer surplus. Surplus means extra, right? So it's your extra. It's how much more you get than we had, what you actually had to pay to get the good in the first place. OK? So basically, um, consider my daughter's demand for songs by Kendrick Lamar. OK? Um, let's, and let's, to make life easy, let's say this is pre-streaming and songs cost a dollar. OK? So she wants songs by Kendrick Lamar. It's actually, so let's actually, yes, yeah, she wants songs by Kendrick Lamar and there isn't streaming. And she, and the songs cost a dollar. So if my daughter's willing to pay a dollar for a Kendrick Lamar song, and it costs a dollar, then her consumer surplus is zero. She's will, her, the, the benefit she gets from the song is a dollar. It costs a dollar, it's zero. But if she was willing to pay $2 for a Kendrick Lamar song, and it only costs a dollar, then she's got a dollar in surplus. Okay. So basically, the key thing is, to define consumer surplus, we need two things, the price and the willingness to pay. Well, how the hell do we get willingness to pay? Where does that come from? Someone raise their hand and tell me. Yeah. The demand curve. We already defined it. We already defined what willingness to pay is. It's the demand curve. So consumer surplus is simply defined as the area below the demand curve above the price. Because that tells you 
The demand curve tells you how much you're willing to pay for each unit. The price you face tells you how much you had to pay. So any gap between them is consumer surplus. Okay, so let's go to figure nine six. Let's do my daughter's demand for Kendrick Lamar songs. Okay. Let's say that her demand is such that, now once again, the trick here is we've drawn a continuous demand curve. It's a discrete decision. So sort of bear with me the numbers, you know, bear with me as you think about this. But roughly speaking, she's willing to pay for the first Kendrick Lamar song between four and five dollars. Okay? For the next Kendrick Lamar song, she's willing to pay between three and four dollars. For the and so on. So this gives you, so let's, to make life easy, let's imagine she's willing to pay $4 for the first Kendrick Lamar song, $3 for the second Kendrick Lamar song, $2 for the third Kendrick Lamar song, and $4 for the first Kendrick, and for, I'm, I'm sorry, and $1 for the fourth Kendrick Lamar song. Okay? So imagine, th that's basically her demand curve. It's not quite that discreet, but we can make it stepwise if you want. Just be ugly looking. Okay? So that's her demand curve. So what does that mean? That means that when she buys the fourth Kendrick Lamar song, okay, when she buys King Kunta or whatever, that is zero surplus. Okay, zero surplus. She was willing to pay a dollar for King Kunta, and she and it costs a dollar, so she's done. Okay. However, what does that mean? That means when she bought Humble, which was her first choice song, okay, she gained a surplus because she paid a dollar for that but she was willing to pay $4 for it. So she gained a surplus. And the surplus is the difference between what she paid, which is represented by the horizontal line at a dollar, and what she was willing to pay, which is the demand curve, which is $4. So she gained that surplus. Yeah? As, as her father, like, you want to get her a gift uh, of like, these Kendrick Lamar songs. Yeah. Uh, and let's say like, it's priced at, like, I don't know, $2 or something like that. Would the consumer surplus be like, what you think she would want out of it, or what she Let me come back to that. It's a great question. There's a famous article about that. And I'll come back to that in one minute. Let me finish this. The bottom line is the surplus there is between what she was willing to pay and what she had to pay, which in the continuous example is this entire triangle. Think of by being able to buy fractions of songs, OK, little, little bits, ringtones, or whatever. OK, fractions of songs. OK, then this entire area under the curve above the price is her surplus. She was willing to pay the points on the curve. She only had to pay the flat line at a dollar. So the entire difference is her surplus. Okay? The key point is this is all driven by diminishing margin utility. That is, she, the reason her surplus goes to zero eventually is because eventually she gets tired of Kendrick Lamar songs. So it goes down. We have diminishing margin utility for the songs. And that's why we get consumer surplus as a triangle. It's the difference between the downward sloping demand curve and the flat price line that the consumer faces. Okay? So the individual consumer surplus, individual consumer surplus, okay, it's her demand, it's an individual graph. Okay? Individual graph. Her demand is downward sloping, and therefore her surplus difference between is the area under the demand curve above the price line. Yeah. <laughs> let's talk about that. Let's let's talk about um, uh, actually, I don't have it here. If, if demand was fairly inelastic, you're absolutely right. The consumer surplus would be infinite because the area under the demand curve above the price line would be infinity. It would be a rectangle going up to infinity. Why is that? Why is the consumer surplus infinite if demand's inelastic? Because they pay anything for it. So at any price, it's a bargain. In theory, if you're, inf if you're incredibly rich, diabetic, you would pay an infinite amount to have insulin. So at any price, you're getting huge surplus. You're getting infinite surplus. Infinity minus anything is infinity. Likewise, what's the consumer surplus if demand is perfectly elastic? Same person. What? Zero. Why? This is the price is going to be at that as well. That's graphically why, but intuitively why. Why do you get no surplus from a good where demand is perfectly elastic? What, what makes a perfectly elastic demand curve? The only way to pay that price for. You have, because why? Because there's substitutes that you're indifferent towards. That's what gets a perfectly last demand. So if I'm indifferent between Juji Fruits, God, you guys probably know Juji Fruits. If I'm indifferent between, oh God, I don't even know what candy is anymore. Uh, whatever, I'm indifferent between candy A and candy B, okay? And then 
I get no surplus from consuming candy A. Why? Because I'm equally happy with candy B. So candy A gives me no surplus. What does the candy people eat? What do people eat? Jolly what? Jolly Rancher. Ranch. I love Jolly Ranchers. OK, uh, you well, no, but that's, that's irrelevant, because Skittles are just disappointing M&Ms. Let's be honest. When you get Skittles, you're just pissed off they're not M&Ms. Am I right? I mean, Skittles are disappointing M&Ms. So, so we can't do that one. Let's do sort of you know, Jolly Ranchers versus Skittles, maybe. Those are more comparable, because M&Ms are better than everything. So basically, Jolly Ranchers and Skittles, since, I get, since I'm indifferent to Jolly Ranchers and Skittles, I get no surplus from being the Skittles, because I would equally be happy having a Jolly Rancher. So surplus is zero for a perfectly elastically demanded good. It's infinite for a perfectly inelastically demanded good. Okay. Now let's go back to the question. There's a famous article in economics called The Deadweight Loss of Christmas. We're such an awful profession. Based about how terrible gift giving is. And why is gift giving terrible? Because if you gave people cash, they could get what they want the most. But if you give them a gift, it's by definition lower surplus than the cash. Because they could always go out and buy that good with the cash. So by definition, giving someone a gift makes them worse off than giving them that same amount of cash. So this guy, he interviewed all the students, I think it was at Penn State, and he asked them how much their parents' presence really worth to them. And he found the deadweight loss of Christmas was like hundreds of billions of dollars. That like people would way rather have cash than the parents. But what did he get wrong? What did he get wrong? Why is that not, why is that not necessarily a bad thing? Yeah, you asked the first question, so go ahead. You like a surprise of opening present? Maybe, but even ignoring that, what else did he get wrong? Yeah. It's like emotional connections with my grandma Bobby. Like that's sort of like the surprise. There's emotional connections. That's all well and good, but that's not very big. Okay. What's really big that he missed? Because the person who buys it, it's like based on like what they get. Yeah, he missed the fact the person who gave it gets utility from giving it. So in fact, the package may be efficient because you're like the surprise and because the person gets utility. But if you compare it to dollars, it's inefficient. So it's kind of a clever, clever little exercise he did. Um, OK, so basically, that's individual consumer surplus. But in this course, we don't care about individual consumer surplus. We care about market consumer surplus. So let's turn to figure 9-7 and think about a market. Let's think about the market for gas. Now, the mechanics is the same here, but we're actually now thinking not about the individual buying one gallon versus two gallons, but the market for gas, how many gallons in aggregate will be bought? But the analysis is the same, OK? That basically, the willingness to pay for gas is the demand curve for gas, the market demand curve for gas. The price is the price. So the difference is the area under the demand curve above the price. The idea here is, for consumers all the way to the left, they have to drive to work. They have to drive. They have to drive a lot. They're truck drivers or whatever. They have to drive a lot. So for them, they have a huge willingness to pay for gas. So they make a huge surplus. The more you want something at a given price, the more surplus you get. Whereas you move to the right, that's who will need to drive less and less. Once you pass point A, why does surplus go away? To the right of point A, why is there no more consumer surplus? Yeah. Didn't happen because? Because it's beyond. Your willingness to pay is below the price. Right? So transaction, so consumer surplus can't go negative. If it went negative, you just wouldn't buy it. So this thing is negative consumer surplus. Okay? If it went negative, you just wouldn't buy it. Okay? But, but as you get closer and closer to A, then you actually do end up with consumer surplus going to zero. Okay? So that's the um, that's sort of mark consumer surplus. So let's ask what let's let's talk about um, a couple of aspects of mark consumer surplus. First question. What happens to consumer surplus when the price changes? Let's show that in figure 9-8. Let's say the price of gas goes up from $3 to $3.50 a gallon. Consumer surplus shrinks by, consumer surplus shrinks by a trapezoid. Consumer surplus used to be the entire area below the demand curve. It used to be the entire area below the demand curve and above $3. It used to be that whole triangle. Now it's just the empty triangle above the new price curve and below the demand curve. So the new consumer surplus is just the area above 350 on the demand curve. So it's the area not shaded in. What you've lost is the trapezoid that goes, that on the y-axis goes between 3 and 350, and then along the, along the line goes from A to B. You've lost that trapezoid. Why is it a trapezoid? Why have you lost 
Why, why is the lost consumer surplus a trapezoid? Because two things have happened. What are the two things that have happened that have reduced your consumer surplus? Get some more folks involved. Folks, the, you know, go ahead. The quantity supplied goes down as well. Well, not, not just quantity supplied, quantity sold goes down. Because you want less supply because you are, um, so the first thing is because the price gone up, you want less, that's the triangle you lost. You have given up units that you used to get surplus on. Used to derive surplus on all the units from 900 to 1,000. So what's happening here is the price goes up and 100 fewer people buy gas. That's the way I've laid this out. Could be people buy less gas. Let's make it easy. 100 fewer people buy gas. So 100 people who used to buy gas no longer buy gas. They're out of the gas market. They bike instead. Okay. Now, they clearly were not that sad to bike, or they would have had a huge surplus from gas. But they're a little sad to bike. It's a crappy day out. They'd rather be driving. And so they lost surplus from the fact that now, at the higher price, they have to bike instead. But it's a little bit of surplus. It's just a little triangle. Okay, so it's a little bit of surplus loss, because some people who are close to indifferent now have to bike instead of driving. But why the big, what the big, what's the big rectangle? Same person. What caused the big rectangle? Increase in price for who? For the people who are already buying it anyway. So the big losers are the people who are going to drive anyway and now just have to pay more for it. Because they, because here's the key point, the people between A and B, people, the last 100 people, they were pretty close to indifferent. They didn't lose that much surplus from not driving. All the people to the left of person 900, they get big surplus from driving. So their surplus simply went down by this rectangle. They used to get the difference between the demand curve and three dollars. Now they just see the demand curve in three fifty. It's just a pure loss. So when you raise a price, the existing the people whose behavior doesn't change are worse off. Some people's behavior changed. They're a little worse off, but not that much. So the triangle's small. The rectangle's big. The big loss is the people who like gas a lot, but not to pay more for it. Okay. Point one. Point two. What determines whether consumer surplus is large or small. Well, we cover this. It's elasticity of demand determines whether consumer surplus is large or small. So for example, figure 9.9 takes the gas market with a price of 3 and 1,000 people buying gas and uses two, shows two different demand curves, both of which go through point A. So both demand curves yield the equilibrium price of 3 and the equilibrium quantity of 1,000. Okay? So these two different demand curves are just two different sets of preferences, both of which yield the same equilibrium outcome. And yet, under the steeper demand curve, the consumer surplus is larger than under the flatter demand curve. And that's for the reason we talked about. That's for the reason that's because with the steeper demand curve, the more inelastic demand, people want the good more. They basically, they're less willing to give it up as the price goes up. Therefore, at any price, they're making more surplus off it. With the flatter demand curve, people are basically closer to indifferent with some other good. So they're not so sad if the price goes up. Their surplus is smaller from getting this good. There's even what they were willing to pay and what they have to pay uh, is smaller. Okay? So that's how we think about consumer surplus. It's basically the excess of your willingness to pay above what you have to pay. So if the price goes up, your surplus goes down, and surplus is larger, the more inelastic is, uh, is the demand curve. Yeah? Does that mean that then like, producers would want it where consumers are having like, a zero surplus? Does that make sense? Because they're at the point where they're not willing to pay more, but they're selling as much as they can. Great question. We'll talk about when we talk about monopolies. Right now, why can't producers do that? Why can't producers exploit that? Because perfectly, yeah. In a perfectly competitive market, they're price takers. Exactly, because they're that's a perfect the answer to a perfectly competitive question. Because they're price takers, okay. So they can't do any exploiting of consumers. They don't have that choice. N starting next lecture or one lecture after, we'll talk about monopoly. Then they're price setters. Then they'll start thinking about that. But right now they can't because they're price takers. I mean, ultimately that's what. The, yeah, ultimately they'd like the sur the surplus is just extra money somebody's got. If you're a business owner, why should consumers have it? They're you know you want it. OK? Uh, so, that's, um, so that's consumer surplus. Any other questions about consumer surplus? OK. Now let's move on, and let's talk about producer surplus.
Let's talk about producer surplus. OK? Now, the idea here is the same. Consumer surplus was the difference between the willingness to pay for a good and its price. Producer surplus is the difference between the willingness to supply a good and its price. And how do we measure willingness to supply? The supply curve. So figure, as figure 910 shows, the producer surplus for any given firm, for any given firm, OK, firms have an upward sloping supply curve. And the market is delivering them some price. So let's think about this firm. When they produce the first unit, this is a, this is a gas production firm, okay, a gas refiner, say. When they refine that first gallon of gas, okay, that costs them almost nothing because marginal costs are upward sloping. They've already paid the fixed costs. They don't care in the short run. So all they care about is variable costs. Okay? So at the end of the day, this is not expensive. They are willing to produce that first gallon really cheaply. They've already invested in this giant refinery plant. Marginal costs are tiny. So they get a huge, but at the same time, you pay them. Th you don't differentiate what you pay per gallon. You, go to the, you plug the thing into your car, and you get the gas. Okay? So they're getting 3 bucks a gallon, but they're not paying much to make that gallon. However, as they make more gallons, their marginal cost increases. So the surplus they earn on each gallon produced shrinks. The surplus they earn at each gallon produced shrinks. And so eventually, they get to a point where they are essentially indifferent about producing the next unit of gasoline. That's at a price of $3 and a quantity of should be little q. Okay? That's the point at which they are indifferent okay, between uh, producing, um, producing gas and not producing gas. Therefore, their surplus is 0. So producer surplus is the difference between the price line and the upward sloping supply curve is produced surplus. Now, in the long run, we have a name for that. It's called profits. Okay? So while consumer surplus is this sort of abstract, weird theoretical concept, producer surplus, you can get your hands around its profits. Basically, in the long run, remember, in the long run, marginal cost equals average cost. right? Because in the long run, you produce until marginal cost equals average cost. Therefore, the supply curve is the average cost curve. Price minus average cost is profits. Therefore, producer surplus is profits. Let me say it again, a little three-line proof for you. Okay. In the long run, marginal cost equals average cost. Second, the supply curve is the marginal cost curve. Therefore, it's the average cost curve. Third, profits is defined as price minus average cost. Fourth, profits is the shaded area. Now, in the short run, that's not quite right because there's the whole shutdown decision, which makes things awkward. But roughly speaking, it's not terrible to think about producer surplus as being profits. That's a shorthand that largely works. If it ever doesn't work, we'll let you know. But that's a shorthand that should largely work. Okay. Now, of course, once again, we don't care about individual firms producer surplus. We care about the market producer surplus. So let's go to figure 911. Figure 911 is basically the market surplus curve. And the idea here is that essentially, to the left, you, ha you have a market supply curve where basically, remember, the individual firm supply curve is always flat. But the market supply curve doesn't have to be, uh, doesn't have to be flat. Okay, The market supply curve, well, no, let me back up. A market supply curve is flat under a certain set of conditions. But now let's imagine that those conditions aren't true. For example, let's go back to I talked at the end of last lecture about heterogeneous firms. Remember, we took the cotton example. Some firms are more efficient producers than others. If all firms are identical and as far as competitive, of course, the market supply curve is flat. So this, this graph would be uninteresting. But in fact, imagine that firms aren't identical. Some firms are more efficient producers than others, Okay, for example. In that case, what you'll see is the most efficient producer will earn the most surplus, i.e., e. the most profit. They're all the way to the left. As you move to the right, you're getting to less and less efficient producers. Okay, So profit is shrinking. So under the conditions we started with last time, then price would always equal supply. It'd be a flat supply curve at the price. And therefore, profits are 0. That is, producer surplus is 0. So we, we derived towards the end of the last lecture, we said in the long run, a perfectly competitive market, profit is 0. That's the same as saying producer surplus is zero. And why is that? That's because in that case, the price line is on top of the supply curve. Therefore, there's no gap between them. 
So in the long run, a perfectly competitive market, there's zero producer surplus, means zero profit. In reality, we talked about conditions why there would be an upward sloping long run supply curve, like firms differ in how efficient they are, or there's barriers to entry, which means some firms can't come in and drive profits to zero, or there's an upward sloping input price curve, meaning that basically the more you want to produce, the more you have to pay workers. For all those reasons, the supply curve slopes up, and therefore you can get a producer surplus, you can get some profits, even the long run. Okay? So basically, what we have here is a situation where as long as the supply curve slopes up, you get a long run producer surplus, which is the difference between the price and the supply curve. Okay, and that is the same as profits. Questions about that? Okay, let me cover one last point. Going back to last lecture, because I don't have time to get to the last lecture. Remember, we talked about three reasons why, in the long run, even in a, even in a competitive market, supply can slope up. We talked about heterogeneous firms. That is, firms with different levels of efficiency of production. We talked about barriers to entry. That is, reasons why firms can't enter and drive profits to zero, because it's not costless to enter. And we talked about upward sloping uh, input supply curves. We talked about the fact that as you produce more, you might have to pay more for your inputs. And therefore, you can't just charge one. You have to charge. Uh, the, you have to charge higher prices as you produce more. I want to highlight something I said quickly last time. The difference between these two and this one. In these two, there are profits. In these two, there are profits. Okay? Because in each of these, there are reasons why the market will not drive every firm to zero profit. Some firms will remain in, much like Pakistan made profits on their cotton sales. Some firms remain in. Likewise, with the barriers to entry, the firms that, have, that are in the market that have gotten over those barriers will make money. Okay? In this case, the firm doesn't necessarily make money. Okay? What it does here is it just pays, it takes that extra money and pays it out to workers. Okay? So whether or not an upward sloping supply curve doesn't necessarily mean the firm makes profit. It could just be upward sloping because their input costs are rising. Okay? So that's sort of an important distinction to keep in mind. So let's stop there um, with that mind-blowing insight. Let's stop there, and we will come back, and we'll talk more about uh, uh, welfare economics. <laughs>